Have you ever seen those social media posts of somebody showing off their huge harvest and it's like one tiny cherry tomato or one sugar snap pea? Like, what are you supposed to do with that? Well, in the first year of gardening, for me, it was my life. I had all these tiny little harvests. But being the glass half full type of lady that I am, I wanted to figure out what do you do with these tiny little harvests? So we're gonna go around today and do some little harvests around the garden. And then I'm gonna share with you my favorite recipe, which is a vegetable quiche. And it is delicious. I'm not one to do like really big harvests all at once. Cause I feel like the longer you leave your fruit and your vegetables out there, especially here in Florida, the quicker the bugs and the squirrels and all the wildlife is going to try to get to it. So I do these small harvests um, throughout the week. So this is me at the beginning of the week handling most of the berries. And so I just got strawberries and now I've moved on to the mulberries, which are in full harvest mode. And the easiest way I have found to harvest these mulberries is actually to get down at the base of the tree and shake it for a few seconds. And usually shaking it will cause the ripe mulberries to fall off the tree. And then I just kind of pick them up from the ground. I'm actually super shocked at how well these mulberries did. They're only, I mean, not even a year old. I have an everbearing and I have a Thai dwarf. Both of them I got from greendreamsfl.com and they have been so highly productive. It's actually really shocking. Probably the fastest fruit tree I have ever grown has been mulberries. And the taste of them, if you've never had a mulberry before, is very similar to the texture of a blackberry, but kind of the taste of a raspberry. They're not quite as sour as like a blackberry is. They're much more sweet like a raspberry. As long as you make sure that you pick them when they are fully ripe and falling off the tree. Next thing in the garden that needed a little bit of attention is these peas. Uh, it's a little late in the season to be harvesting peas. Um, these are a cool weather crop and we're sitting here in the middle of April. It was a goal of mine to be able to grow a year supply of our peas this year. Unfortunately, the first round of peas that I put in didn't do so well. And then I kind of ran out of space and I didn't have a place to put more peas and I was waiting on a trellis. It was all these reasons. And so these peas didn't make it into the beds until probably around like late December, early January, and they took forever. But I will say, even though I may not have been able to get a year supply of peas, um, I have had a positive, which is that I have found a pea variety that I absolutely adore. Now I have grown sugar snap peas, snow peas, um, lots of different varieties of those. And I've done, you know, a few videos on those if you want to check that out. But shelling peas have been a bit elusive and I haven't really found a variety I liked until this year. These are called tall telephone and I got them from MI Gardener and they are outstanding. You can see how productive they are. They are crazy productive. They are very, very tall. And the cool thing about them is that each one of these pods has probably about 10 peas. And these are very large peas. These are not small peas. And so for just probably two square feet, um, I was able to produce and they are still producing. So I'm still taking peas off this plant. But so far I have gotten about a quart size bags of the shelled peas, which I think is pretty good for just two square feet. And what this is telling me is that next year, I'm gonna try to make more progress on being able to grow a year supply of peas. I'm thinking we probably need about one to two gallon size bags. So if two square feet gets me a quart size bag, I probably need about a full half of a bed full of these pea plants. And that would probably equate to four packs of the, the seeds from MI Gardener. But what I'm gonna do, it is an heirloom variety. So I am going to leave some of the pea pods on this plant so that I can save peas for myself or pea seeds for myself. The peas aren't always ready all at the same time. They kind of happen in flushes. So what I do is I feel around and I look for the ones where when I try to press the pod, you see me doing it right there. I'm pressing the pod to see if I can find the ones that um, have 
no give. Like when they have a little bit of give, that means that the peas haven't completely filled out inside the pod yet. And so I feel for the ones that don't give any give. And then I pick them off the plant and then you'll see me here, I'm shelling them. And you can see how large these peas are. These are not your little grocery store peas. These are very large peas and I've tried them. They are incredibly sweet. They are so, so good. They are now our favorite variety. Because I don't harvest them all at once, um, I do little harvest. This is an example of probably about a week of harvesting. And so I'll break them apart. I'll take the peas out of the shells. And then when I go inside, I will blanch them. Um, and I kind of do a lazy person's blanch. I don't want to like get out a pot and heat up my house and my stove. So instead, I actually use a little kettle that I usually use for heating up water for my teas or for the coffee or something like that. And I actually bring that water in the kettle to a boil. I put the peas in a little uh, Pyrex glass container, fill it up with that hot water, let it sit for about two minutes, drain that water off, rinse it with some cold water, and then I put those peas in a Ziploc baggie into my freezer and they keep perfectly that way. And once the season is done, once I know all the plants um, have produced as many peas as they possibly can, I will take that bag and I will um, separate it and vacuum seal it so that that way, you know, they, they last for as long as possible. Now this next item I'm doing, I'm actually very surprised with the results of what happened here. <laughs> this was a green stock. I was doing a winter experiment where I was growing some warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and it didn't have the best results. The tomatoes did produce but they weren't like great. Um, but in the top one I was like what else can I put here? You know I didn't want to just leave it empty so I thought you know I found some sprouted potatoes from the grocery store in my pantry and I'm like you know what I'm just going to throw those in there and see what happens. And I really did not expect much because they didn't put off like a lot of foliage. Um, in fact, they didn't put off very much foliage at all. <laughs> but uh, as I'm kind of rooting around in here, I am noticing that they actually did produce a little bit of, uh, of a uh, harvest here. I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Obviously, I would, you know, want a larger harvest. These are kind of the harvests that I've been getting in my garden from potatoes. Not super great. Uh, but I do have a video that's going to be coming up soon where I'm going to show you the harvest of my potatoes out of my garden beds. And those, I believe, did much better. So keep an eye out for that. But for a green stalk that was sitting empty and, you know, some leftover potatoes in the pantry, I'm super happy I was able to actually get a harvest off of these guys. I think they are a Yukon gold potato, which once again has not been my favorite variety to grow in the garden. Another really big surprise for the season has been these uh, tomatoes in containers. And I've not always been a big believer of tomatoes in containers, but last year I did a an experiment to see which grows better in the in the raised garden beds or in the containers. And the raised garden beds did grow better, but I got so much feedback from you guys about how to get my container tomatoes to grow um, better and longer. And I took that into account and I made all of those changes like composting in place and trying to find a lighter container to grow them so they don't get so hot, giving them some shade. There was like a lot of suggestions and I did that. And I had a great success over the winter with these fall and winter tomatoes, um, which normally I don't get fall well, I get fall tomatoes, but I don't get winter tomatoes because where I'm at, we get enough frost that it kills tomatoes. But with them in containers or in green stalks or in pots, I can move them into my shed for the coldest days. And I was able to have tomatoes nonstop all the way from, I think, September to now. And my spring tomatoes are right around the corner. They are just about ready. So I'm moving from these guys onto the uh, spring tomatoes. And you can see here, I'm actually harvesting broccoli, which is super shocking for here in Florida to be harvesting broccoli this late in the season. Uh, broccoli is a cool weather crop. They do not like our heat, but this is that, that variety I absolutely love called Arcadia. And they just handle the heat so much better. I had harvested the main heads of these broccoli plants back 
oh, probably a month or two ago. And now I'm just kind of collecting the side shoots. They do seem to be wanting to go to seed. They do seem to want to be bolting. So I'm taking this last harvest and I think that's probably going to be it for me. The other one that has been holding out here is this Savoy cabbage. It has taken forever. I really wanted to grow Savoya. I heard they grew well down here. I will say they are heat tolerant because this guy right here has been sitting in the heat for months and months and months and has not given me any indication whatsoever that it was going to bolt. Um, so they are pretty heat tolerant, which I was surprised about, but they are like a long season crop. This one has been in the garden as long as all of my other cabbages. And you can see here, it didn't get super big and I think it needed more time. So I'm definitely going to be starting my Savoy cabbages much earlier in the season, but I love this variety. In terms of taste, you can basically use this Savoy cabbage almost like a lettuce. And that's why I've been using it in a lot of you know, dishes where it calls for uh, lettuce, like in tacos or in egg roll in a bowl dishes, those kinds of things. Now, the last brassica I have here in the garden is this guy, and this is a Romanesca. The Romanescas did grow for me. Once again, they are late season. A lot of the ones that you're seeing me harvest right now are very late season. Uh, the original ones seemed to do a lot better and now that we've gotten much further into the heat, the heads of these have not been great. They've been much smaller. And I really just want to get this giant plant out of the garden so I can put different things in this bed. But we'll take this last harvest. You can cook the leaves and use them um, in salads or in greens in your cooking. And they work great. Then we have some green onions. These are my multiplier green onions. I know this was really popular in a video I did recently on the, the top 10 money saving crops because it's a perennial and it, it multiplies itself. And a lot of you guys had questions as to like where to get these. Now I got these from a friend of the channel. Um, so unfortunately I can't tell you exactly, but I have done some research and I believe that what they're called is the Florida Finley uh, multiplier onion. The only place that I've noticed that has that exact brand is Cody Cove Farms. Cody Cove Farms. Um, and they seem to be out of it right now, but keep an eye on it or get on their wait list and um, wait for them to come up with some more because I'm telling you, you will never buy another green onion again with these plants. Another really shocking brassica in the garden here. This is called Prism Kale. And it is the only kale that I have in the garden right now that does not seem to be showing any signs of heat issues. I'm really shocked about this because this is, I wanted a curly kale. Um, I like the curly fluffy leaves of a kale. I like dinosaur kale and red Russian kale as well, but I really, really love these. <laughs> And I didn't think that once the heat came that they would actually do well, but they are still putting off just as many leaves. They're not bitter at all. They have the same taste that they had um, when it was in winter and they are still producing an exceptional amount. So I'm, I'm going to let them keep growing for as long as they want, hoping that they bolt so that I can save some seed from them. So we're almost finished with our harvest. The last thing we have to get is this garlic. It looks just about done, but I am a little iffy about harvesting it because it's an odd situation. <laughs> so normally I get seed garlic and then I plant the cloves of the seed garlic. But this last year I was going on a vacation and I wasn't going to be home to get it or to put it in the refrigerator, which is required. Vernalization is required for down here in Florida. Um, and I wasn't going to be here. So, you know, I saved my garlic that I had planted the previous year and I used that. Well, I thought I had separated the cloves properly <laughs> and I did not because I had multiple shoots come up and I'll show you that. But I had multiple shoots come up from one single clove. So I know that that meant that there was two or three cloves inside of the one that I thought was one clove. But when I saw that happen, I was like, what am I going to do? So I just left it. I wanted to see what would happen. So I'm not really expecting a lot from this garlic, but let's pull it up. Let's see what happened. So this is one example right here um, where I have, looks like three that are coming out of the same spot. This is those three cloves. So let's pull this one. You can see most of the plant is dead, at least 75%. Very curious about this. Oh my goodness. Okay. It created... It created three heads. Huh. Did not expect that. Now this head looks pretty good. 
this one has clearly split. I let it go too long and this one is starting to split, but still I can, I can use all this garlic. So we definitely have like a lot of splitting. You can see it all over. And those won't keep super long in storage, but that's okay. I do have some that didn't split, um, some decent sized ones that didn't split. So those I will keep for storage and the rest of these I will process probably by um, mincing them and putting them in oil in the freezer or turning them into garlic powder in the freeze dryer. Now these other ones right here, I'm not pulling up yet. These are the elephant garlic that we planted and they're not dying back yet. They also haven't created scapes, which I believe they're supposed to. Um, so since those haven't died back yet, we're gonna leave those and we'll harvest those another time. Now let's jump right into the best part, which is let's cook with our harvest. And we're gonna be making a vegetable quiche. And so I took a shortcut and I bought some pie crust, <laughs> some frozen pie crust. I have made pie crust in the past. I am not the best. I have been pretty good at cooking for a long time and I've really gotten into sourdough baking of breads, um, but desserts and you know all butter pie crust have not been something that I've been super great at. So I've done it, but uh, for this purpose, I just wanted it to be good. So no shame in getting a pre-cooked pie crust. I put some holes in it. I stuck it in the oven at 375 for about 15 minutes. Uh, you could use the pie weight um, to keep it from fluffing up. Mine did fluff up, but I just pushed it back down and it was fine. And then I started to put some of our harvest into a two cup size measuring cup. And I started out with some of the green onions that I had frozen and the peas that I had blanched and frozen. And now we're chopping up some of that broccoli that we had that were the side shoots to put in the quiche as well. After doing this recipe, I kind of realized that two cups was probably too much. Unless you have a larger pie um, tin than what I did, mine was kind of a shallow tin. But if you have a you know deeper pie crust, or a deeper pie tin, you could probably do the two cups. What I would aim for next time is probably about a cup to a cup and a half. And you can see I am really, really filling up this two cup measure. So then we also have the tomatoes that we picked. I collect the tomatoes throughout the week and I put them in a recycled container. That's a strawberry container. Um, make sure that you wash all your vegetables, obviously. I wash and uh, rinse all mine and dry them out when I bring them in from the garden on that day. And then that way I can just pull them out of the refrigerator and use them as needed. I'm chopping my tomatoes in halves or quarters depending on their size. And then I'm going to take some of this kale and I'm going to strip it off of the stem of the kale and chop it up pretty finely. I, I am going to end up putting this on the top um, so that it kind of sticks up. I kind of like the look of this frilly kale sitting on top of the quiche. I think it gives it such a pretty look as well as it keeps that kale nice and crunchy when it sits on top because it kind of pokes up through the egg and cream and cheese mixture. The next step in the recipe is to add either half and half, if you have that, or you can use half milk, half cream, and you want three-fourths of a cup of that together. So I just use three-fourths of a cup of half and half, and then we're going to add in six eggs. 
To the eggs, I'm going to be adding in one and a half cups of cheese. I went with mozzarella because that's what I had, but I think the recipe that I was going with, which I'll put down into the description, actually calls for cheddar cheese, and they used ham and cheddar. I just substituted the ham with vegetables. Added some salt and pepper. I used some sea salt because I like that in dishes where you really want to taste the salt through it. And this is a lot of eggs and a lot of cream. So you kind of want that nice balance of seasoning. Um, I forgot to add the garlic because I think garlic would have been awesome in this recipe, but, but I totally forgot it. <laughs> it was awesome either way. So the pie crust is out of the oven and I'm just going to drop all of the veggies into the center of the pie. I had way too much and this is where you can see that I obviously had overfilled it because it's completely full right here and now I'm like okay let's add some kale somehow to the top of this uh, but it all worked out uh, it, it it did end up pushing a lot of the egg mixture up and out of the pie so probably don't fill it as much as I did here because you will end up with a mess I'm grateful that I put a cookie tray underneath because that is what caught all of the extra egg custard that came out. So I'm pouring the egg all over the top and that egg mixture has a lot of cheese and that cheese kind of comes out at the end here. You're going to see it right there. And I noticed that that wasn't really mixing in very well. And I thought, oh no, this is maybe not going to turn out well, but wait till you guys see because it looks really spectacular. I was actually pretty shocked that it came out the way that it did because I really did not expect that but you know just keep trying things in the kitchen and in the garden because sometimes you're going to stumble upon new ways of doing things usually people want you to mix those vegetables and the cheese and the egg and the cream all together before you pie it, put it in the pie pan I didn't do that I ended up having it spill over but the end result was outstanding it was like this layer of crusty trees at the top this nice you know soft custardy egg filling in the center my husband absolutely adored it and he said that from now on I must always make my quiches like this because he just loved it you see that kale sticking out the top that nice brown on the top is also that cheese that has kind of formed a crust and it's nice and crunchy so you have like the crust is crunchy the kale is crunchy the cheese is crunchy and then you get to the center of this pie and you have this like soft egg creamy velvety custard mixed with all of these amazing vegetables that came right out of your garden i hope you guys enjoyed today i had fun hanging out with you i hope you had fun hanging out with me and make sure you try this recipe happy gardening guys Thank you.